Welcome back, everyone. We are nearing the end of our non chili or uh, wild game cook off events. Hang in there. And in this next couple of sessions, kind of ready yourself for a few different short pitches and announcements about a, a number of opportunities. We're going to start with hunting and food security, how to spread the harvest and then move into student and professional opportunities at 3.15. And we will pause for uh, some questions via Slido after each of these speakers and pitches. Uh, please also kind of consider these sessions a little more casual. Feel free to approach one of the folks that shared if you wanna follow up as well. And maybe even if we're a little bit slow to respond on Slido, we'll try to do so. So just keep looking out for answers to your questions there. Uh, with that, I'm delighted to reintroduce someone I've mentioned a couple of times, and that is Dan Zadra from the CPW. Uh, who knows Dan in the room? Quite a few of you, I'm really glad to see that. Um, and I, I, Dan has a special place in my path to hunting my very first hunt a big game, a cow elk, uh, Dan was right by my side. And I remember thinking in that moment and in the years since then about my gratitude, not only to that cow elk and that gratitude was tremendous, but to the humans that made that experience possible for me. Dan has done that for so many folks. Uh, so let's go ahead and welcome Dan to the stage. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, I'm honored to be here, uh, to be asked to, to be here, to uh, speak to you, even if it's about something about like roadkill. Uh, after uh, Brian's presentation, that's a little tough to follow. I'm a little disappointed now. I didn't bring my puppet presentation on roadkill, but uh, we'll have to bear with it. What I got. So yeah, uh, harvesting roadkill is a lot of good uh, protein out there. So why would we harvest roadkill? These uh, this is from 2022. Over 4,500 deer, 654 elk. 93 pronghorn uh, were killed on highways. Um, a lot of those, there's there's more than that. A lot of them aren't reported than a lot on uh, county and, and city roads. Um, so there's, there's a lot of protein lying out there um, that's available for you to take. I'm gonna skip to... So if we're gonna do it, we need to, to do it right. Um, I'll kind of gloss over this real quick. This is our regulation from Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, with uh, uh, provisions for uh, donating what we, what we donate wildlife. Um, so it's, our regional manager's responsibility. Um, some of these other in uh, C, you know, if you want, there's, we can have issue prior letters um, to let you pick stuff up. That's not used very often. That's more for like zoos, um, uh, stuff like that, uh, rehab centers. The main one would be uh, number three, is a, a donation and a certificate that that you'll want to want to get from us. So the first thing, you know, if if you want to take a a roadkill, you know, you you need to have that uh, permit to to possess it. Um, you can get it from us. You, mainly from us or the uh, highway patrol get it. But so you, 
leave a paper trail, make sure, you know, uh, that it's documented. Uh, call, you can call our office, call, you know, it doesn't warrant a call to 911, but the dispatch, uh, which sure picks you up, and there's always somebody that uh, that we can, that'll respond to you and tell you. You can pick that animal up um, and gut it out and get it, but you have to have that permit within within 48 hours. So take pictures, get some good documentation of, of where it is um, when you call. Give give good directions. Uh, I'll give a little plug for one of my pet peeves when people report stuff. Uh, you know, when you call and say, there's a herd deer east of Gunnison on the left side of the road. Well, there's every road has two left sides, has two right sides. You know, be specific. Compass directions are, are really, really good. Mile markers are great. Um, a lot of times, um, that animal isn't dead, you know. So when when you see a, an injured animal, and we get lots and lots of calls for that, get lots of questions about can I kill that? Simple answer: No. You know, call us. Wait for a professional to do it. Um, it's I know people. Well, I got to put it out of its misery. A lot of times, if it's not done right, it can be a lot more inhumane to that animal. And you know, like I said, it's it's illegal for you to do that. When I first started years ago with, uh, it was the Division of Wildlife then, I worked with a guy named Cliff Coggill. Jessica, uh, him, he was a game warden for like 50 years. And his, his deal was when people called, if you can scratch them on the nose, you can kill them. You know, so if you can scratch an animal, they're just about dead anyway. But even then, it's not legal for you to shoot those. Uh, wait wait for the professionals to get there. Get a good location. We'll go. A lot of times, I think physiologically, these animals get hit. It's been my experience, you know, that they'll cripple off, lay down. Um, some of them recover. Uh, we can evaluate that. But if they're just laying there, and you shoot them, it's it's dangerous. If you don't hit them right, you know, I have seen horrible things. Jaws shot off, noses shot off. It, it's it's not, not a good thing. You know, you could be shooting down that, that asphalt. There's other vehicles around. So um, don't try to kill them with a knife either. I've seen seen that. Just leave them be, call us, and, uh, and we can put them down. There's other reasons I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. You want to be safe, you know, when you're when you're recovering some of these um, animals. Uh, a lot of mostly it's going to be in the winter time when these these animals are uh, on the road next to the road. So yeah, slick roads, you know, use your head if it's uh, on a blind curve or, or something, you know, park in a safe spot, make sure you're uh, flashers are on. If you got to park away and drag it and get help, you know, if, if you need, if you need to. Being on a road, stuff that's tempting, they might be, you might be recovering an animal that's laying right beside the road. You want to get the, the guts out of it, probably, you know, out there in the field so you don't have to to mess with it, get it off away from the road, drag it, drag it off a ways. Eagles, all kinds of critters are attracted to that stuff. So, you know, the, the more you get it off the way, you know, you're gonna alleviate some some issues with, with the eagles uh, getting hit uh, by the vehicles. Of course, you know, probably some of you will be will be new to to getting uh, harvesting some of these this roadkill. I haven't even been around a, a dead animal like some of the talks before about you know gutting 
rabbit. Rabbits are one thing and elks another thing. You know, be realistic in, in what you're going to try to do. Get help. And like it's been mentioned before, mentors. Mentors are a good thing. You know, if you had somebody that's been through this before, be sure to uh, recruit their recruit their help. Um, so you pick up this animal. Just be aware. You're, it's it's quite often it, it's not going to be pristine meat once you start working on it. Um, there's going to be some damage. There's going to be a lot, a lot of scrap. You know, once you process this, um, you're going to have to dispose of the, the rest of the, the animal that, that you don't that you don't use. You know, be considerate um, when you're getting rid of this uh, stuff. Be considerate of your your neighbors. Um, just instead of just throwing it out in the yard, it, it attracts all kinds of scavengers. Um, we at CPW we we use uh, roadkill quite a bit. We can we pick it and accumulate quite a bit of it at our office. Thank God we don't have neighbors close because you know even in town there by Safeway you know we have lots of animals. We pick them up for during bad winters, um, analyzing the, the femurs of them to look for the, the condition of the bone marrow for their body condition. So, you know, we can tell what uh, the, the herd's looking like as far as uh, uh, nutrition. Um, lately, we've been using a lot of them for uh, bait uh, for our lion collaring project. So yeah, we get a bunch piled up sometimes and pieces, parts that attract a lot of animals and you don't want to want to do that to your neighbors. Um, if you go throw it out, don't, you know, we get calls all the time. People, oh, somebody killed a deer and they, they threw it out of here. Don't, don't throw it where people recreate, where people park to recreate. Hartman's Rocks is not a good place to throw out pieces of, uh, of salvaged deer and animal. Uh, to be honest with you, the best place for this stuff is the landfill. Um, put it in the trash and, and haul it off. There's a, a big deal now with uh, subsidy, food subsidies for ravens. Um, the raven population increase may or may not be, but possibly is affecting our tennis and sage grouse population. So a lot of the roadkill is getting picked up the, the highway department is not hauling it out and dumping it in, in piles anymore. It's it's going to landfill everything that if we use it, we, we're putting it in the landfill. So it gets buried and it's not providing food subsidies for the for the ravens to then that could predate on sage grouse nails. <clears throat> Another thing that we have is a, is a donation list. Um, we maintain at our office. It's mostly for confiscations during hunting season. Like now, you know, when I get back to the office, there's liable to be some, some animals hanging there. You can come into our office or call and get on a, a donation list. It's not necessarily for road kills because we don't pick up and process road kills so much but uh but the animals that get confiscated during when somebody screws up during hunting season you know we'll we'll clean them up and sometimes skin them have them quartered and then we we call the people on the list i'll tell you uh needy needy families you know get priority on that and uh, that's actually one of the more better parts of my job is is doling that meat out to people that, that really appreciate it. Um, back to my points here. So certain animals, um, deer and elk and antelope, they're, we're, we're fine donating those. Um, big trophy ones, don't expect to keep the, the head on those. Um, we'll, uh, we'll probably 
take the hit. Uh, bighorn sheep, same deal. Um, if they get hit, we want to know about it, and we will we will look at it first. Chances are we will we will keep the the head. Um, other animals, bears, mountain lions. Um, you need a license to even possess. You know the the head, hide, claws, skull of those animals. So uh, road kill ones. Just report it. If you're interested in the, the meat, sometimes we can even maybe donate that. You'd have to buy a hunting license. And if, if you can buy a purchase a, a valid hunting license, we could possibly let you have the, the head, uh, the hide of that. But chances are that we, we can give you the, the meat. Uh, a few final thoughts. Um, so yeah, the harvesting roadkill, especially after listening to uh, some of these other talks, you know, it's it's a good it's a good thing to do. Um, you know, you're you're utilizing these animals that might be going to waste in in some respects. If you can handle that, you know, you yourself, you're not when you kill something. You know, you want to use, I want to use every bite, you know, uh, but with a rope kill, there's some of that that you're not going to be able to, you know, so you can still get good meat and you don't have to be worried about wasting since it was probably going to, it was going to be wasted if you didn't take it anyway. Um, it's going to be more popular, you know, there's more people doing it now. When I was a kid, you know, you kind of people look down. Oh God, he eats roadkill, you know. And, and now, shoot, I've I've had to go break up fights, you know, up, you know, toward Roar and Judy when a nice elk gets hit and it's not damaged bad, show up and people are fist fighting over it, you know. That's, you don't want to do that, please. Um, or again, use a mentor, um, and just another plug for. Us at CPW, you know, any any questions you have on wildlife issues, don't hesitate to call. Um, we can be reached easily at any time. Um, and not just for roadkill. If you see something funny, see something interesting, let us know. All right. Dan, I think I'll just ask you one question before we turn it over to our next guest. Uh, you mentioned families in need having top priority when it comes to animals you've confiscated. How is uh, that kind of access, or that maybe I should say that that opportunity shared? How do, how do folks find out about uh, getting that meat if they if they need it? So they call our office. A lot of you know it's it's people we know. A lot of elderly people. You know they they come in. So. Uh, if we can see when they, the, the girls at the front desk make her, the chart. And then you can make comments on there, you know, about why you need this. You know, there's some people that can't have any fat in their diet. So they're, if they want to eat meat, it's got to be wild game, lean wild game. So, uh, yeah, like, like that, you know. Like moose, big elk, we'll split between several different people. So, Thank yeah, you. there's quite a few opportunities. Right. I see a few more questions. I might try to grab Dan and answer those um, on Slido. So look out for those. For now, Dan's going to come back up on the sca uh, stage in a little bit. But next, I'd like to introduce Jody Kane from the Gunnison Country Food Pantry. Does this come on? Yeah. There we are. Hi, everyone. I don't have a, a fancy slide. I'm just going to chat at you for a couple of minutes about Gunnison Country Food Pantry. My name is Jody Payne. I'm the executive director. Um, Gunnison Country Food Pantry's mission is to provide food assistance to those in need in a kind, confidential, and supportive environment. And food insecurity can mean and look like a lot of things. 
Um, but essentially, it's the gap between the amount of. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Is that on? I think. Hello? Yes, it is. Okay. Is sorry. this thing on? Um, it's the gap between, you know, having the amount of food we need, the amount of resources, and actually um, being able to make our uh, make ends meet. So it's an economic issue. Usually, we don't have enough financial resources to get food that we need. Um, and a lot of the times at the food pantry, over seventy percent of folks who access our services are working full or part time or our student. And so, um, you know, it's a lot of the times it's folks who are working really hard, multiple jobs. Um, and just experiencing a gap in, in getting all of the resources that they need. So the food pantry has three key programs that help bridge the gap for, some, for our neighbors. We have uh, shopping the pantry for no cost groceries on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. That's open to the general public to come in and shop our, our grocery store. We have a food pantry here on campus. How many of you have heard of the food pantry on campus? That's such good news. Oh, God, that's such, a, that's such good news. Um, the Mountaineer Marketplace distributes food on Mondays and Thursdays to students, faculty, and staff. Um, additionally, we have home deliveries on Tuesdays and Fridays, and those go out to individuals who experience barriers to shopping in the food pantry. So that program launched during COVID as a response to folks not being able to leave their homes. But later, we learned that we have a lot of homebound seniors um, who can't access the food pantry. We have single mothers, we have folks who, you know, experience a medical accident or an injury and they just need some temporary support. And so we deliver food to their homes each week. We have food on the move. So our outreach food efforts, which include our fresh mobile pantry. Um, if any of you live in Mountaineer Village, you might've seen or heard the fresh mobile pantry on a Saturday morning that goes out Monday through, or Monday, that goes out May through November on Saturday mornings. Um, into hunger hotspots in our community. So it's my identified spots where folks could use fresh produce. And then we have emergency boxes in 26 locations all over town. So if someone's in a crisis, um, whether it's someone who's rolling through town or a you know community member, they can access emergency food when the food pantry isn't open. Um, so places like the police departments in both Gunnison and Crested Butte, the libraries hold emergency food boxes in a couple other, other locations. Um, and our third key program is food for children. So we have a gunny pack program. Gunny packs go out on Friday afternoons. They're delivered directly to children's homes. Um, children who are eligible, their families apply to receive a gunny pack. And it's essentially four meals and about seven snacks that help bridge the gap from Friday to Monday when students are or children are at, at homes with their family. Um, and we have mini pantries in every school in Gunnison Watershed School District. So a trusted adult can take a child to a mini pantry. Um, that child can ask to visit the mini pantry, but it holds healthy snacks. It holds meals that are ready to go um, and things that that child could also take home. And so where does all of our food come from? We have a lot of outreach efforts. We, we distribute a lot of food. This year, uh, we've actually distributed food to over 1,800 1, of our neighbors. And that number is growing as, as our year continues to wrap up and we've reached over 800 neighbors via outreach programs. So the fresh mobile pantry, emergency boxes, gunny packs, um, which is really exciting. So we need a lot of food to make all of that happen. And we have four main food sources. We have a food bank that is based in Colorado Springs. They send us food once a month. This month is Thanksgiving time. And so we had a 12,000 pound trip order that was full of turkeys. Um, which is really exciting. We distribute Thanksgiving turkeys to families during this time of year. Um, and that comes once a month to help supplement our, our food. We have Feeding America partners. So Feeding America is a kind of a bridge organization between a food pantry and Walmart, Safeway, City Market, and Natural Berkshire is also a Feeding America partner. And when food has to come off of their shelves because of a Best Buy or expiration date, Feeding America helps organize orchestrate uh, them saving that for the food pantry and us picking that up. So Monday through Friday, we have food recovery efforts with all of the grocery stores to pick up food that would have went in the trash, but is really still good for folks to eat. Um, and then we have community donations. So this time of year, you might see a lot of red bucket food drives. 
around town, maybe your your job, you've seen them, or the post office has an ongoing bread bucket food drive. So th that community food is really helpful, um, as well as we call it walk-in. So we're talking about hunting. Hunters are actually a, a, a huge donor for us in that they're people who had an Airbnb here for two weeks and they bought way too much food and they make sure they walk it in our door and drop it off before they leave so it doesn't go to waste. But additionally, Solif asked me to speak just a little about, bit about if the pantry accepts wild game. And we do accept um, wild game. It has to be processed in a USDA facility. And that's just because I, I'm sure you all have best practices in your home. I'm sure of it, but I can't guarantee it. <laughs> and so we really want to protect our guests. We want to protect the pantry. And so we we love wild game. We absolutely accept it. We encourage folks when they're hunting, as they're rotating their freezer because they just got a, a new deer that you can think of us for that meat that maybe you don't want to eat that have been sitting in your freezer freezer for a couple of months. We'll absolutely accept that. We used to have a wild game fund um, and around 2020 when COVID hit that effort kind of fell to the side but we would not be opposed to folks wanting to give specifically to an effort like that as well as if someone you know uh, hunts a deer or a large animal and says well we only want 80% of this. We want to donate the other 20%. We have funds available to discuss how could we maybe help um, fund some of the processing of, of this animal. And a lot of it just comes down to co the cost benefit, right? How many folks are we going to be able to feed? Is this a reasonable cost for what, what the output is? But we're open to it and we'd love to have more conversations about it. Um, if someone's really interested in like ramping that program up for the food pantry, we're always accepting interns and special projects and things. Um, and really that, I think that's my, my kind of brief bit on the food pantry. Yeah. I have a quick question. So when I called a few years ago and talked to someone at the food, mm -hmm. food pantry about this, one of the things that they told me is that you only can accept ground meat. Is that still correct? We will accept more than ground meat, but really what we don't want is like a massive part of an animal that we can't distribute. Right. right. right? And so if it's parceled off in a way that maybe you know, a four family household could enjoy this piece of meat and a two family household could enjoy this piece of meat. Um, we're open to that, but what we don't want is like, what do we do with a whole deer? Right. Um, we can't do anything with that. So good question. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Jody. A few questions and apologies if you were answering these while I was That's okay. uh, focused on the um, When does the new food pantry open? We opened in October. Um, October 10th was our grand opening. And so if you haven't seen our new space, you're welcome to come by. Someone's available 9 a.m. to 12, Monday through Friday at the pantry always. And so please stop in and, and visit our new grocery store. Thank you. Do you need volunteer drivers for Tuesdays and Fridays? For, uh, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not a volunteer lady, but we almost always need volunteers and we have a lot of folks who take time off during the holidays. And so this is a good time to inquire if you are interested, but yes, we always need volunteers. Great. And lastly, is it strictly dry and non-perishable items in the food pantry? Are there any cold goods available? Yeah, so we we say it's like a, a little grocery store. We purchase produce. I guess I didn't mention our fourth main source of food, which is that I fundraise. I have a team that helps me fundraise for a food budget uh, because an increased need is happening. And I'm sure all of you go to the grocery store and groceries are so expensive. And so we have a food budget that allows us to purchase milk, eggs, cheese, butter. We purchase produce. We actually are working on getting more funding that is specifically for fresh produce so that we have to spend it on really good and healthy things. So there's a variety variety of things at the at the pantry and when you shop there it won't always be the same experience because we rely on the generosity of others on a charitable food system if you go to the pantry this week Safeway was cleaning out their freezers and we got some really good pizzas we got some ice cream you know really exciting stuff but Safeway doesn't clean out their freezer every week right so there's a lot of variety based off of seasonality and the charity of others thank you so yeah, much Joni let's see her hand I know that no one has heard about tonight's wild game cook-off yet, so I'll finish uh, this session letting you know that you can get some free food tonight here at 5 p.m. Uh, with that, give us just uh, 60 seconds to transition to the last panel for the day um, on student and professional opportunities.
use just one moment. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. I think we see you clearly. Okay. I'll let folks know. Right. Okay. Okay. The panelists. Yeah. The next panelist. Yes. They are on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I was misunderstanding. No, question. no, Brit, it's Brit and then back to Anne. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thanks, Sounds good. Yeah. Recreation management. So, recreation body is kind of always in this part of my brain um, within it. Um, but in that, I've worked with public lands for the last know, 15 years, um, being that bridge between academics and um, opportunities in public lands. And that's on from everything from recreation to um, people getting involved with hunting um, to people becoming professionals um, within everything from hydrology um, to um, zoology. I think <laughs> I think if I if I count it all in that. So what we're hoping to do is again support opportunities, um, especially for students to, in my mind, either become advocates or professionals um, in public lands. Um, and in that, um, again, thanks to uh, Dr. Clark's work, there's a USDA grant that is supporting graduate assistantships to help us build um, opportunities for internships. And it's not just my program, but it's also um, with countries of color and with Cold Harbor. Um, in that. So there's opportunities for graduate students in the next few years to become those um, GAs. Um, and then in that, we're going to be um, offering lots of different realms of internships from like short learning about different public lands or different um, organizations all the way into more professional and long term internships within that. Um, other thing that, again, I just get to jump on the bat and black and with is the National Science Foundation's um, National Research Training Program. And we have an employees um, 
program that comes from that grant. And it's again, supporting graduate students and opportunities um, within the um, Masters of Science and Ecology and Masters of Environmental Management. So kind of bridge those two programs. Um, but also we're being able to develop some fun curriculum um, within that. So next semester we'll be offering a diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. One credit class, so graduate students, I know, please. It just got put on the books in the last minute. Um, so we'll be starting to get that out there within it. Um, but it really is opportunities to support young scientists, and there's a lot that goes into that um, within it. And again, we have to point to Courtney because she's the backbone of that program um, within it. Um, the other ways that we have to get involved is again, right now, we're really trying to get the word out. Um, four service jobs just closed for next season, um, but you can still kind of look at um, USA Jobs, and if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, for BLM, um, not on USA Jobs, is Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, are still hiring, and back on USA Jobs is the National Park Service. Um, other ways to get involved with those folks that will be hiring between uh, December, January, February is uh, a lot of the youth force in the area. So Southwest um, Conservation Corps out of Durango, um, my own program uh, at Southern Utah University, it's the IIC. So if you want to go and check out Southern Utah, I can give you information on that. But it's a really great way to get your foot into the door into a lot of different opportunities within public finance um, is to do that. Um, other things, uh, thanks to, again, work that's been done is the Taylor Park Adaptive Management Plan. We do have regular meetings um, for that. And the whole idea is to continue to support public engagement and public understanding of vegetation management that's happening up in Taylor Park. And so kind of learn from all those opportunities we have from that um, within it. Um, and then Paul Romero, who also works with me, is going to be uh, leading out on winter recreation monitoring that happens up in Crested Butte. Um, so there's two undergraduate positions that we just posted. So hopefully that gives you an overview of what we're up to right now. And again, um, I'm new. Western has given me a great gift this semester to just kind of learn the lay of the land and meet lots of people um, and get ideas as to like what can the Center for Public Lands do to really create a really good solid bridge between Western and public lands um, in the next um, in the next five or ten years. So I'm excited to be part of this. I'm thrilled to be a Western and I think that's all I have to say. So if you have questions I will be hanging out a little bit. I am fortunate to back over to Dan, and we're going to bring Jody King back up. Hi, me again. Um, really quick, I, I'm grateful for an opportunity to share something that's coming down the pipeline for the pantry. We have an AmeriCorps position, position opening up on January 15th. Um, this was our first year ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was really uh, This is our first year hosting in AmeriCorps, and it has been a really awesome experience. I actually used to work at Western. I used to work with college students, and so I love working with young people. Um, and the food pantry is a great spot for, I think, a, a person to really learn and grow and um, uh, have some autonomy. And so we have this AmeriCorps position coming up, and it's through Mountain Roots Healthy Futures. And we are kind of trying to target grad graduate students because there's some really unique opportunities within the AmeriCorps Healthy Futures Program for um, students who are studying things that align with the, the position that they are in. So this is a food security coordinator would be the position. Um, it would include things like helping us recruit, retain, um, place volunteers, train volunteers, help us with our operations, um, program management, program reporting, program evaluation, as well as two special projects. And the reason I reached out and, and wanted to talk to Salib about this is we have a food recovery program. I mentioned we pick up groceries or food from the grocery store Monday through Friday. We have a vision of expanding that to restaurants 
to weddings, to banquet halls. So when folks are coming here and visiting throughout, you know, the summer, especially being able to recover that food in a way that's safe, um, in a way that can go back to our neighbors and that ultimately we're helping create less waste. Um, and in our minds, that sounded really easy. And then we started thinking about it and we're like, oh my, this is way beyond our wheelhouse. And so we are trying to tap into someone who's young, someone who'd be really excited to work on this project, maybe someone who would like this to be a part of their master's project. And what's nice about AmeriCorps is when your classwork aligns with your work that you're doing for the service program, you don't have to choose. So you work 40 hours a week and maybe seven of that is classwork and you know, a dual project that you're doing or if you're taking classes that relate to um, you know, food waste or uh, sustainable practices or um, poverty, rural, um, behavioral health, all of those things. Those are courses that I would be open to talking about being considered um, work time. And so we really want this position to be flexible. I, I know what it's like to work, you know, throughout grad school. Um, and so we would really like to find someone who's driven and, and motivated and wants to help make our community better, but wants a, a meaningful experience. And so, sorry, I talked to you a lot. The, the, the main things to remember is this is a position that would help recruit volunteers. So working one-on-one -on -one within the community, um, a position that will help strengthen our operations. So learning how we report data, how we record data, how do we keep organized, a lot of administrative um, learning there, and then a, a project based around food recovery, as well as helping support pop-up pantries in Mount Crested View and Crested View. So we're working on some North Valley outreach in this position it would essentially help head that up. Um, and then, yeah, working 40 hours a week, flexible with uh, grad school and your classes. If you have any questions, I'm an active boogie, but I gave Sola, um, some packets with the job description, my card, and some more information on the food pantry. If you're interested, please email me um, a copy of your resume, and we'll just get a, a, a time down to chat. And if you have questions, that's also perfect. And if you just want to reach out and, and see the pantry and learn a little bit more about what the position would entail, we're, we're open to that. Um, but that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. All right. And finally, for this session, we'll bring Dan Badger back up to talk about an opportunity that is actually not necessarily just for students. So if you're a community member or non-student joining us today, uh, please consider whether this sounds like the right program for you. And, and having been a participant, what he's about to describe, I cannot speak more highly about it. Back to Dan. Thank you so much for that. Okay, uh, I want to thank Kate for uh, doing my PowerPoints here. I, I didn't have a lot of stuff together, and she had a ton of other things going on and, and was able to put this together for me. I appreciate yeah. it. So, I'm going to talk about our, our Castleton Branch Mentor Hunt Elk Hunt program. Um, we started this a uh, oh, couple, three years ago, I guess. Um, the Castleton Ranch, I don't know if you're all familiar with it, big place up at the Forks of Ohio Creek and uh, uh, Carbon Creek, 7,000 acres, um, privately owned, wonderful elk habitat. As always, there was a lot of um, conflict because the, the owners didn't hunt very much, very little, um, didn't allow any access. Uh, on there. So harbored a bunch of elk. There's tons of hunting pressure all around it. So it always harbors a huge amount of elk um, that stay on there until after hunting season and then they come off and then and they're on the neighbors that actually grow hay and cows for a living. So uh, it was a contentious issue for quite a while. My, my boss ran the diamond, uh, worked with the, the landowner and the, the ranch manager, uh, Craig Jackson, to start taking some some hunts on there. Um, they're really controlled. Uh, it's not a free for all big shoot fest like my friend into 
and some of the public land deals we a lot. Um, usually hunted just Tuesdays and, and Thursday evenings. Um, and we'll start oh, in, in uh, um, at the end of August and then run through. I did uh, last Thursday, uh, we did the last hunt up there to two uh, ladies up there. And unfortunately, the snowstorm had pushed all the elk off there. There was one bull that, since it's cow elk, we can harvest. So uh, they didn't get anything. This this program starts out. Uh, we'll ask for applications. Those will the notices will come out in in November or uh, January, February sometime. Um, the district officer, uh, Clayton Bondurant, he'll be uh, probably giving some to Kate, um, Pat McGee, uh, and well, there'll be stuff in the newspaper um, where you can uh, submit an application. It's more of a resume about why you your hunting experience, uh, why you'd want to participate in this, and then we'll be uh, pick from there. Um, who's going to get a go? So we'll start with um, in the springtime. We'll, whoever's going to be in it will have a classroom session on wildlife management, why we're doing this, a lot of shop placement. <clears throat> and the group can be pretty, pretty big. So half half the day will be spent in our office um, doing this classroom stuff, learning about wildlife management. Why not? I'll have the other half out at the at the range doing shooting. And if you haven't shot before, uh, not a big deal. We you don't have a gun, a rifle. We provide we can provide that for you. I've had um, people that just terrified of, of the idea of shooting a gun. They did at first they were shaking so bad they couldn't even hold the gun. You know what? I work with them and, and they've actually turned into very good shooters um, and, and been successful hunters. Kate was good from the start. Um, yeah. uh, so we do that and then and then uh, oh through the the summer we will do practice sessions at the range. Um, we try to alleviate any issues, like I said, any fear of your your gun. Uh, we want you to, to shoot well. Um, it came up a couple of times here during the panel discussion. The importance of a quick, clean, humane kill. We're all about that. So uh, um, we're not, hunting is not done in a laboratory. Things can and, and do happen, but we're gonna try to uh, minimize. Uh, what can happen so and in fact this last year we even did like a qualifying and you had to shoot so so good to, to participate in the program after and that was after several uh, training sessions and then once we uh, get through that then we will go through and, and prioritize who's who's going to go first and everything there's some, uh, I've, I've been able to meet incredible people uh, doing this. I guided hunters for years and years and new hunters that want to get into this. It's so much more rewarding than taking out some good old boy that just dumped a few thousand dollars to, to, to gun down an elk. Yeah, this is a, a rewarding experience for both the, for me and the participants. And like I said, some of these pictures, that the habitat is incredible. Once you, uh, we go out and, and hunt, there's all these elk, basically undisturbed elk. Uh, so of course, through that, a lot of that fall, there are bugling, you're getting a see you know, elk behavior that most people don't get get to witness.
this and be right in the in the middle of it. Um, when you do get a good opportunity and you take your shot and your shot's good, um, I'll be right there with you. Either you know, if you want to uh, attempt to gut it, I'll talk you through it. If not, I'll do it and explain what I'm doing. Uh, either way, we'll get the animal out, take it to the the barn at the ranch, uh, lay it out on the floor. That uh, top picture there, that's uh, we get it skinned, quartered, we give you the meat, we provide the game bags and everything, and, and you can uh, take it home or take it to the, the processor. Um, last year, we worked a lot with uh, uh, County Extension Service, uh, Tina Haney, with the food services and step part of the uh, extension office did some meat processing seminars at the multi-purpose building uh, explained how to, to cut out steaks and process animals and wrap it up um, we even had a, a similar thing like what's going on tonight with different people bringing in wild game so you can try different recipes and then usually in the in the winter time here in the bottom, we get together and have a recap and all the participants uh, given their thoughts and feelings that uh, that they experienced do this and uh, kind of a, a pizza party. But then some of us are a little sick of meat, but not too bad. So so we eat pizza and talk about how fun our, our elk hunting was on the on the castle and the ranch. So anybody that's interested in this, I just tell you now, just to be watching in January, February, check in with our office. Like I said, feel free to, to call um, if your students here. Um, we will be putting out a lot of the information here, and uh, and feel free to uh, apply. Do we have questions, Jay? Um, I'm not seeing any. Specifically for Dan for this part, feel free to uh, send those in. I will add, sort of related to one of the questions from what Dan sh shared earlier, uh, one of these referred to um, elderly folks with mobility issues, others that can't dress the meat themselves, can they receive the donated meat? That was a question from before. And I just wanted to add that I think that this is a great program for folks that would have a number of different challenges and engaging in hunts on their own. So please spread that with folks that, that you think could take, take advantage of this when other options are less available. And I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so I think we're good. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Give us just a moment and we're transitioning into our wrap up. All right, well, just to wrap up the day's events in terms of these different conference sessions and kind of where we've been starting last night with Erica Nelson and through just now with some of these opportunities on how to get involved. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you all for participating. Um, I've had a good time. I hope you've all enjoyed this. It's been worthwhile and that you've learned something. 
Um, earlier, when we introduced the day in the morning, um, I forgot to kind of explain um, why we've called this hunting for humanity. And um, hopefully now you kind of have gathered a sense of that. Um, but one meaning is obviously like what hunting is for our species, for who we are as a people, like what role it plays. So hunting for humanity, but also kind of that ever ongoing search for our humanity. And so hunting in that sense for the humanity that exists in our relationships with each other and in our relationships with the natural world um, and the other living things that are part of that with us, that, um, in community with us. Um, so those are the two main entendres for that hunting for humanity. Um, at different points, I've thought of or remembered another one or two, but they're escaping me right now. But those are kind of the two things um, in terms of what we mean by hunting for humanity. And I hope you felt both of those um, meanings in the events of the conference, both last night with Eric and Nelson's keynote talk and throughout the different sessions today um, surrounding ethics and um, DEIJ and hunting, as well as some of these um, more applied or practical uh, sessions on um, how to spread the, how to spread harvest and how to get involved. Um, so thank you again. Um, if you have any further questions about this topic or other ways to get involved, or if you're just a little apprehensive or nervous and not sure what to do, if you want to explore hunting or fishing a little bit more, um, you can always find myself um, and Dr. Clark in Kelly Hall um, and by email. Um, we'll put our emails up at some point because mine will be hard to remember anyway. But um, so, but we invite you to keep on having this conversation with us. One of my favorite things to do is answer questions for people, especially about things like hunting and fishing so that I can neglect some of my more boring work that I have to do. Um, if you ever wanna learn more about different types of weapons from traditional bows, um, like long bows and recurve bows that I enjoy shooting all the way up to different types of rifles or shotguns, I'm also very happy to talk about those things. And Hunters of Color, which is one of the organizations that I'm involved with and, rep and represent here in Colorado. Um, so thanks again. I'm going to pass, uh, pass it off to Kate for our very final remarks. And I look forward to seeing you all tonight to try various um, wild game dishes with us. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, quickly again, need to thank our supporters and sponsors, Hunters of Color, Colorado Wildlife Federation, CPW. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I mentioned this briefly at the beginning of our keynote last night, but it is, it is worth repeating. Jess White, who put up all of our flyers all over town. Thanks, Jess, if you're watching. Um, Jillian Bauer, one of the heroes of the Clark School, who um, can't join us, but has been working hard all semester to help us make this happen. Paul Rivera, who is helping organize the cookout tonight. And most especially, Lindsay Golenbaugh. Thank you, the four of you. I'm so grateful to everyone that came together to make the last couple of days possible. All of our panelists, all of our speakers, um, everyone in the audience. And just wanted to take a moment to thank especially the students in EMBS 398. So Liz and I have loved working with all of you. So many of you came to these issues in this space, totally brand new, non-hunters, non-fishermen and women. And uh, I'm really moved and really inspired at how passionate you remain about your values and simultaneously how open-minded and willing to learn and how curious you were throughout the course of our time together and our processing and detect of lead ties. Thank you, each one of you. I'll look forward to following up with anyone who can on Tuesday, November 14th. Uh, the final bit of Headwaters, a little bit removed from our conference, is an important tradition called the Passing of the Gourd. That'll be led by Art Good Times, one of the mainstays of Headwaters over the years. So keep thinking about what you've learned, and everyone, not just Headwaters 398 students, Keep talking to people, people you know, and most especially people that you don't yet know. 
please take advantage of this opportunity to learn about the world of hunting and fishing and even firearms to expand your relationships, to build bridges, uh, and to make all of our communities better, stronger, and healthier for everyone. One last time, thank you, everyone. Enjoy. <laughs>